This was uh, the last film appearance of Phyllis Kunimura. The, the last time um, Phyllis Kunimura was uh, on film, you know. The, I think it was very fortunate that the society was able to do that. Yeah, what timing, yeah. And uh, it wasn't sh very long after this video she passed away. And uh, yeah, to see her there and mem uh, memorialize is really cool. The same thing happened is when the society did the backyard music. The, shortly after, many of our great composers and musicians started to pass, and immediately these films became, you know, part of the legacy. And uh, the society once again uh, was fortunate to be able to record that and these people. Today is the 104th anniversary or the 104th annual meeting of the Kauai Historical Society. And um, so I thought I'd go back to some of the history because um, we don't cover it too often. And, um, but it's a fascinating journey. Next one. May 7th, 1914 is our birthday. Normally all of our annual, annual meetings are taking place in May. But I think May becomes a super busy month with everybody, graduation and things like that. Um, they began to shift it into different parts of it. When the, uh, you can see the original mission statement of the society right here. Uh, still today, we're still holding true to all of that. The annual fee being a dollar, is still there. And you'll see a little bit later on at the end of the 1914, the, um, the treasurer's report. The big bank account, $6.60. <laughs> um, in those days, the board of directors was called the, uh, the board of managers. But here, right next to it, is a letter by Carter, who is the president of the Hawaiian Historical Society. He's also an ex-governor of Hawaii. And uh, in, there's many sentences here that are important, but one in particular is, uh, most people forget they were making history. One criticism of our society is that you can avoid, um, that we are too largely devoted to reducing a matter already in existence. And he's telling the, the founders of the society just because uh, instead of developing original matter, that was very important to everybody at the beginning that the development of original matter, the society has stayed true to that for 104 years. And not only that, but uh, as you'll see, their organizational records are phenomenal. And uh, we'll go into it. Next point, please. Again, this is the constitution, the first constitution of the Kauai Historical Society and some of the languages right here. These are the signers of the Constitution. They are charter members. And we'll go through the list. The charter members and the ordinary members. And um, already you can start to look at some of these, these names right here, all of these families. These are names that uh, many of you will recognize, but others, um, you need to find out who these guys are. Um, next one. These are still, as you're going down the list of the charter members of the society right here, though, on this list, and it continues right there. Um, and then uh, into the active members. Next one. Here are the honorary members. Essentially, it's a list from 1914 to 1939 right here. You can see on some of the, on the, some of the people right here. Uh, love to be able to talk to you about every single one of them. The last one is Peter Buck. The, um, Peter Buck was uh, half Maori, uh, half Kiwi, and um, he was there at Gallipoli, essentially got into uh, uh, ethnology, wrote important papers, and became the director of the Bishop Museum. So the society had these relationships with these experts all over the planet, and I'll be showing you uh, a few of them, just to give you an idea of the, the scale of things. These, now the society has the minutes, it has the committee reports, the, um, it has um, all of the receipts and things, so I just thought I'd show you a few receipts of things back in 1914. 
But uh, the immaculate way in which they kept the records is phenomenal. After I made myself familiar with all of this material, I went to the Hawaiian Historical Society because I wanted to see the mirrors. We have their letters, but we don't have copies of our letters being sent out, and I wanted to see those. And it turns out the Hawaiian Historical Society has no records in any way, shape, or form of any of their minutes or organizational records in any way, shape, or form. That's too bad. That's a crime. And uh, so I was not able to find the, the counterparts to everything that we're dealing with here. These are the letters that the honorary members write. Some of them are really cool. They're beautiful. Um, others are expressing that I'm getting a little bit too old. and. Uh, Thank you very much, but uh, no thank you. Others are going, yeah, I'm going to write you a paper. And uh, next one. So you can see W.O. Gulick right here. You can see uh, this one is Lut uh, Lieutenant Halford, or Master Gunner Halford. He was the survivor of the Saginaw, the wreck of the Saginaw. That was in 1873, Rex and Curie. I don't know how familiar you are with the story. Um, but. Uh, they were there, I think, for like six months. They built out uh, a gig and sailed from Cure, uh, three of them. They crash landed on the, the reef at Kalihiwai. Two died. Halford is the only survivor. That set in motion for the kingdom to go up to Cure to go rescue everyone else and brought everyone else home. So this is a huge thing that goes on. And as you'll see a little bit later on, the, the society is in direct contact with these members of this expedition. So they're getting first-hand accounts. And in the society, we have first-hand accounts by the people on the Saginaw. Not only that, but we have a beautiful story. The, one of the first stories in the Kauai papers. And then uh, Roll, again, as you get into Roll, they're one of the first missionaries. This is a descendant. You had Gulick, Roll, Whitney, and, and others. And uh, next one. Well, this one, oh, we'll go back to that one. Uh, there was something in here, next one, the next one back, yeah. When I was in Wainiha, I got for Dr. Emerson. This is N.B. Emerson, father of J.S. Emerson. Also, uh, N.B. Emerson at this time is with the Bishop Museum. And uh, you can see he's collecting a hula of uh, the pua, or the pig, a hula on the, on the pig in Wainiha. And so that's in our society also. Many other hulas are there also. Next one. Again, um, the memberships for the charter members, they started in May 14th, 1907. By July 1, it closed. So essentially, there was the motion that, that created the charter members of the society. And uh, at some point, I think we'll, we'll be able to get all these names of the charter members, the honorary members, up on the wall. And then right there, you know, um, they decided to keep these immaculate records. Now, you had Elsie Wilcox, and we'll get into her in a, in a bit. And then right next to it is, you know, the receipts for the ledger books. The society kept superb records on every part of it. The, um, next one. Now, this is a letter from Halford right here, but uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now, Mr. Carter, again, he's the president of the Historical Society, and he's offering his library, which at, the point, at that time was better than the society. So again, the, um, this relationship with the Hawaiian Historical Society starts at the very beginning, the, um, and it's something that we still need to be maintaining, our relationship with them. And at some point, we're going to have to remind them of uh, our history together. Also, at the same time, these guys publish a lot, and um, they do have a cool president right now. And then um, this is a letter from uh, Lieutenant Halford, and, uh, of which you know there are many details in this. Next page. The, and it continues on right there. So I highly recommend anybody has the time to kind of go through our correspondence and minutes and the committee reports. And then um, the first officers, William Hyde Rice, J.M. Lydgate, or Reverend Lydgate, and Elsie Wilcox. This stays that way, for, I think, for the next 12 years. The GM Lydgates, I think, passes away in 10 years from here, and uh, William Hyde Rice passes away in 1924. The Elsie Wilcox lives for quite a while. Now, Bob can talk about that for a while. The um, next one. Now, this one is interesting. Lucia Kamamalu Holdman. 
It is something that crops up every once in a while. This woman was born uh, in uh, Waimea, 1820, 1821, and she is the first American lady or woman to circumnavigate the globe. Now, Kamamalu is a princess. This is Kikua Na'oa's daughter. And uh, in order for her to receive the name, especially that name, it had to be granted by the family. So clearly she has a, a connection to the, the highest ranking families of Hawaii. And in her possession is this beautiful whale tooth and a feather cloak. And I think that's part of the insignia that the family gave the, to Lucia. Now the society is in, is in direct correspondence with this family and so there's many more letters uh, in regards to her. But I think in terms of, in our archives, I should like to know a lot more about this woman. I think her story needs to be born in white male. And she's the first lady to circumnavigate the globe. I wouldn't mind knowing a little bit more about it. And then, you know, Mr. Hofgard, who is Judge Hofgard, or Hofgard's story in white male, the, also writes that he's familiar with the Ruggles home, because she was born in the Ruggles home. It's in Makaweli side. The foundations are still there. And so essentially, he's corroborating the story. The um, next one. Now, the, the object is for the members to be writing papers. Or kawaii papers, you know, really turns out to be a super treasure trove. Again, they're trying to develop original material. They're not trying to hash the, the, rehash the old stuff. Even though it's forgotten, they created new materials. The society has published several books on the papers, but by no means have they published all of them. And uh, anyone wanting an introduction into Kauai, go through those. There's about six black books. It's in 11 by 14 format, double space. But those books are, um, and those articles, you will blow your mind. You're there from all kinds of people, and lots of people you'll recognize. The, so these papers were being presented, and all of them ends up into the society as the permanent record. And then um, you can see Reverend Legate goes to Oakland to visit Halford. And with it with, comes this whole story of this visit with uh, Master Gunner Halford. The list of active members continues all the way up. And again, it's a list of who's who. I thought for we thought to uh, go through some of the names, but there's too much history in the society. Well, the point today is just to give you a brief overlook. That uh, early on, 1914, they decided to collect the Garden Island newspaper. In the society is every single copy. The Garden Island was started in 1904, but a fire in 1911 burned it to the ground. And so to, be, to find a Garden Island from 1904 to 1911 is rare. I've seen fragments of it here and there. But to find an original uh, 1904, good luck. Let, me, let us know. But I'm always on the hunt to, to, for those years right there, the early years of it. But since the fire, we have every single one of them. And it's a, really jo it's a joy to pull them out and uh, just be able to see in 1915, you know, what the headlines were. The, um, it's a, it's, I enjoy it. Next one. And then um, this information as a gathering on the Saginaw, so you, could, you can imagine just what there is in the, in, the, in the society. A lot of this is unpublished material on the Saginaw. I think recently the society did something on the Saginaw. Didn't we? The, the wreck of the Saginaw? We have a couple from Australia. Okay. They only recently found out that the man was related to Halford. Okay. Because it was another branch of the Halford family. Yeah, one of these nights we'll have to do that story. It's pretty interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a rough story. They were starving up there. And uh, the, um, the history of Lihui. Again, many of the members wrote. So we have both the feminine and male accounts uh, of growing up in old Lihue. And uh, many of the rim women at the time wrote for this too. And those accounts are really important because you're getting an, uh, an important vignette uh, from their perspective. And it's always hard in history to get, the, to get a balance. But the, the women wrote for the society. And so we have quite a bit on the early history Bits and pieces of it published, but not all of it. We still have some gems. I have a question. On the Garden Island newspaper, what would have been printed in 1910, 1915? Would it have been about World War 
No, yeah, World War One's not till 17. But, uh, yeah, both. Still both. Yeah. Yeah, mostly it's Hawaii news, though, but every once in a while they will have uh, some international bits. But I'm going to get to World War One on Kauai just very briefly. And that's a question for Andy Bushnell. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> and then, um, now here's uh, Josephine Wundenberg King. Uh, her husband was the manager of Hanalei Plantation. Uh, Hanalei Plantation is early, so they're there in Hanalei in the 1840s, developing the plantation, and then she writes several things for the society. Um, and then we also have an engraving, 1864, of Hanalei of the mill itself. Yeah, it's, it's never been published, uh, but it's there. She, she was a phenomenal artist. And um, next one. Yeah, I was hoping we'd be able to read a little bit more of the background. I had to make it a little bit opaque, you know, to bring the text out. But uh, the, um, quite a bit on the early days of Koloa. And again, in these minutes, there are little vignettes. And, I'm, and uh, I can only explain a few of them. And then amusing anecdotes by all kinds of people. Now, this is a little journey into the history of Koloa. The, the, if you haven't read it, you know, there's all these treasure stories, you know, these murders, and, uh, and uh, there's mayhem going on uh, also, as well as some really cool things. The Oromel Gulick is another next generation up. The, um, and then uh, very early on, the society, again, if you looked at the charter members, there's several Hawaiians in it. The, and so the concern for, for the Hawaiian race and preserving what was there was on the minds of uh, our founders. And, uh, and here, you know, this particular one, there are many notable Hawaiians of fine character. In a letter, in the correspondence, is a list of these Hawaiians that, uh, that, that uh, I was hoping to have it. I have it, but uh, I never got it in there in order to show you the, the names. And I think at this point, uh, I know about half of them already, and I can give you a buy on half. But the other half is, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I better raise, raise the my raised the bar there with this. But in the society, we have their stories. Next one. Now, early on, 1914, they made a stand on Hawaiian language. As you can imagine, in those days, that was not a cool thing to do at all. Now, the society does stand up for some, some good things. And even though they got a lot of flack for it, they did stand up for the preservation of the Hawaiian language early on when no one else would. They did try to get it into the high schools, you know, for the senior year, one class. They ran into a stone wall. And uh, they tried to get Kamehameha schools to at least teach Hawaiian, but they wouldn't do it. And they tried to do it through the, through the colleges. No one was going to teach a course in Hawaiian. But they stuck their necks out on the line and went public uh, with all of this. And then um, there's a report from the treasurer ending the first year right there, uh, $6.60. Oh, I misspelled it, sorry. The, um, now comes Judge Dickey's story, the stories of Wailua. This manuscript, if you're not familiar with it, is, is critical. And essentially, it sets in motion the first of the main advocacy that's coming up. So they're just beginning to warm up, and now they're going to work. Next one. Now, in the, uh, now, here's the list of Hawaiians right here. Well, no, no there's ships right here. Now, in the correspondence, you know, you'll see right there, of the schooners which sailed between Kauai and Hawaii, uh, Oahu, some of you will recognize the names of these ships right here. The, there's several of them I'm not familiar with. But uh, I don't think the society has uh, a bio on any of those ships. We have a little bit of background, but do you remember, you know, in terms of the, this early shipping, so we still have this to do in a sense, and anybody interested in the maritime history of this island, go to town with this. There's your list of ships. Uh, having, um, most of them didn't keep journals, or most of them, the journals never survived. Andy, were these mostly sailing ships? Or yes, sailing, sailing ships. ships. Not no, not steam engine yet. These are all sailing ships right here. Early 1820s. Uh, on up, and that, um, but I'm sure you recognize some of them. I know Andy does. 
<laughs> oh, you can. Oh, that's the worstest. The next one. This is when the society is starting to move on preserving Wai Lua. They take the first of their big stands in terms of preserving Wai Lua. And the reason why, one of the big reasons why the society was formed was that even in those days, they were, they were seeing Wailua getting hammered. And they start and set out to go to work. And uh, so essentially coming out of uh, Lyle Dickey's story, the interest really gets up and the ball starts to roll. The, um, you can see the society in uh, correspondence with Honolulu Monumental Works the, um, for the the quotes on, on the type of uh, marking they were going to be doing. It ends up into a brass plaque, but there's many steps before even that happens. Next one. This, is, uh, this letter here is from Brigham right here. He's with the Bishop Museum. The, um, and uh, he's writing for the, the society on his experiences in, in Hanalei. This particular scientist right here goes on to write numerous things and has quite the career. And again, another illuminary of its day right there. The society has his, uh, the featherworks, the hale, the tapa, uh, some of the big monograms. And some of you are familiar with the Bishop Museum, uh, 1900s monograms. There were the big, large folio books. And uh, we have them in the society. Thomas Thrum. Thomas Thrum is famous famous uh, historian. The, um, he's the one that does the memoirs of Fornander, all of those volumes. He's the one who also does all of the, um, the almanac. The society has every single almanac, uh, so you can actually go in and, and take a look at it. I think you're about 1870s forward. And then in it, you can see every single ship arrival, all the statistics, how many people died, who arrived, and uh, things like that. Also in it are articles that stretch through so many decades. And there's some articles of some really high quality. That's in the society. Um, you can pick and read one anytime. Next one. Here's another letter of Thomas Thrum. He's at the time writing about the Heiaus uh, in, the, um, in the Hawaiian Islands. So he's actually in correspondence with the society in terms of identification of our Heiaus. He's already come out with the main list in 1907 and 1908, but he's still continuing here in 1915. That it takes him a while, and then you can see already that the, the elements that are still missing in Hanalei that Thrum is still trying to gather. Society has, was in correspondence with uh, the very top of the, the Catholic Church, and then try to organize the history of it. The, um, in our files, we have huge amount on, on this. Next one. This is their letter right here. And essentially, uh, on this side right here, it's listing every single Catholic priest on the island from the very first one. The, the last year is 1915. Uh, so it's uh, 1840s uh, to 1915. So there's a list of all the Catholic priests and quite a bit of detail that are straight up primary source material. Uh, for this story. Next one. The Brown Estate, or the Wailua Falls Estate, uh, was a famous residence at the, at the Wailua Falls. And um, here there's a kind of a little funny story right here of them dismantling this house and then rebuilding it in Kawaihao. And, uh, but the whole, but the, it took such a while to, to, to move the house that they, the sides of the roads were just covered with all of this material. And, um, and a reference is made to that. In the middle of the, in the minutes is this little vignette of Deborah Kapule. Now, in the society, we have quite a bit of material of it. Now, this one right here, why isn't anybody quoting it? And um, at Deborah's, uh, Deborah's house at Wailua, uh, I remember her as a very tall woman dressed in a black holoholoku. Her grass house was immense and a double decker. Timber being laid across about eight feet from the ground, to which covered with mats served as a sleeping place. Both ends of the house were arranged in this way. And as to Hawaiians always sleep with the head out, that's a curious statement, the, the, that Hawaiians are sleeping with their heads out. But the image is, is that um, 
The, the two rows of sleeping heads which we saw when we awakened in the morning were an amusing sight. A particular noise was heard during the night uh, and in the morning they turned out to be goats. <laughs> um, but this little vignette of our house, of Deborah Capulli's house, and, uh, is, is an important little, little scene right there. If you add it to the other ones, I think you're really developing this picture of Deborah Capulli. Um, one of, the, one of the important women of the island. And then um, this letter is from Van Holt right here. And then some of the, and in this particular case, it may be of interest you know that upon Mr. Brown's arrival in the islands, this is early 1840s, the, he brought a number of plants and trees, among them two magnolias, one of which were given to Godfrey Rhodes. He's one of the early, one of the first guys in Hanalei to develop the silk plantation. And we'll get a little bit more into the silk industry of Hanalei. The, and again, he's introducing it. But he has two magnolias, and then the other one was planted in the grounds near Wailua Falls. He also brought the heliotrope, Easter lilies, and uh, the ranta. And so already, knowing who brings what plants is really important. Uh, much later on, the, the society uh, incorporated the papers of the Hui Manu Society. The Hui Manu in the 1930s essentially is the ones who brings in the shama thrush the Chinese thrush, the, the manjito bird, um, and others, and the shama, all of that. We have the receipts and where in China they were taking, which ship that bird traveled, and the date those birds arrived here on this island. So to give you an idea of the immaculate detail of what's happening in, in these records. The next one. My grandmother was obviously a botanist, so you know, pedigree of plants matters. And um, knowing which trees and who brought what um, to me is very interesting. I almost got disinherited because uh, I picked two, yellow, two oranges on this little tiny tree. Um, but it turned out that was a cutting from the original first orange tree brought in by uh, Don Paolo Francisco Marin. And, uh, and I didn't know that. And uh, you know, I, I picked these oranges, drug, juggled them, and threw them. And my grandmother from her bedroom with her binos was watching these, you know, these oranges grow, right? And uh, I got dirty lickings. And from then on, I never, you know, a plant is not a plant. There's something very special. You better stop and think first, right? And so I can point to you to the bunch of trees on this island. Who brought it, when and what, uh, things like that. Here, this particular paper right here uh, was important when we were searching for all of the various burial grounds in Waimea, in terms of we needed to know where Deborah Kapuli was buried. We eventually find her through all of this record, so now we know exactly where she is in Waimea, as well as many others. And there are like three or four important Ali'i uh, burials, grounds in Waimea. The, never mind what happens to them. Next one. The Whitney auction is pretty interesting the, because of the, the list of artifacts that was collected by the Whitney family. And, and so we have the catalog and things that were, what were sold out of the Whitney family. It's a nice vignette uh, into that family and the nature of things they collected. Next one. Kalui Ko'olau. This is the Kalalau story. He's Ko'olau the leper or the Kalalau war. The, um, this happens in 1893. The, um, and they're in contact with the principal members, especially Judge Hofgard, who's instrumental in writing the story of Pete Lani, his wife. The, um, and uh, for those of you familiar with this story, he's a national hero of our island. The um, details of this man is, uh, and his story is, uh, is utterly fascinating. I've been preparing for the Napali Coastal Hana, a big lecture on that whole thing, and uh, with material that is not published. Now, no one's ever seen the material I'm going to be presenting on my le next lecture on him. He's an interesting man. So was his wife, Peter Lani. Here we have uh, Farley, who's doing a paper on the, on the visit to 1865. A bunch of these papers were important when I was doing the trail research through Ko'olau, you know, following the government, the, the old government trail, or the Alanui Aupuni. And uh, m in many of these papers are vignettes of them going through the Kauai roads. And uh, yeah, today, only once in a while are we on the old road. 
But uh, as I drive every single time, I'm always aware of the history and what road, and are we on the old part of the road or on the new part right there. Next one. Now, here's World War I. The society closes its doors for two and a half years for World War I. I was familiar, uh, Andy, about the, the, I have tracked the World War I through the plantations. I've seen the plantation workers get drafted or volunteer. And, uh, but in terms of other details of what was really happening on Kauai in World War I, um, my knowledge of it is shallow. I couldn't, you know, it was bothering me after I started to realize that uh, it did have an impact to this island. Just how profound, I'm not sure. And uh, so I thought, you know, next time I had a little bit of chance, I'd look into that a little bit more. I don't know if you have had a chance to study that. Uh... There's, there's not that much impact. Uh, I mean, there is an impact, but it's not that, that many people go to war. Most of the people who go to war are uh, actually the Haoles who are the the main families whose sons feel it's important for them to be loyal and go out and serve. Yeah. There are a few, there are some uh, uh, plantation workers. Yep, that they, went. They, they mostly volunteer. They're not yep. drafting. No, they're, uh, I, they were volunteers from the ones I'm aware of. The only one like that who, there was one guy who was from Kilauea who was gassed during the war. Okay. Oh, but died. Uh, All right. But I'm sure a bunch of them never came home. And, uh, and so they, it actually did have an impact. I thought I'd go through the Garden Island newspaper at that, during this period to see what was up. It has more of an impact in terms of everybody getting together and uh, folding up bandages and making mittens and woolens. Yes. And, and, and that ramps up during World War II to the max. That's quite a bit of documentation on World War II. But World War I is, uh, is interesting. The Heiau Committee is formed. The story of the Killer Patcher's Barge, which is Ha'eo Hawaii. It is Kamehameha II's, uh, she was the finest ship of her, of her day, and um, sank in Hanalei Bay. Smithsonian, few, uh, some years ago, went and uh, excavated it. It's right there in front of Waioli, of the river mouth. So she wrecked by the pier, and the currents brought her and beached her. And, um, Two, three thousand people were gathered, L ropes were tied to the mast, and they were trying to pull the ship up uh, onto the sand. And uh, there's this whole story um, about the chance they were using in order to haul the ship. The mast breaks, the ship slides back down, and we're done. But coming out of that are cannons. I don't, I'm mentioning the cannons because, you know, we still start to, he we still hear it, just not too long. A week ago, I heard. Uh, again, you know, last month I heard someone else about cannons. Supposedly, the, the main story is that when they were decommissioning the, the Russian fort in, uh, 19, in 1830s or so, one cannon fell over and is somewhere in the bay. And so that has sparked out, you know, since that moment, exactly. Now, in our minutes right here, we have the, now we have uh, Valdemar Knudsen who was in charge, and he was there that day. He was in charge of loading the ships. And so now we're getting primary source accounts to that. No mention of dropping any cannons uh, in any of that. Also, there's many cannons running around Kauai. And then as we go through, you'll see the story of cannons. It's, all, it's on a lot of people's minds. So I thought that the, the, some of the details in terms of the other cannons that were running around, but we'll get into that in a bit. Next one. Here's another letter from um, Brigham. Uh, I'm not going to quote that one right now. Um, now this one right here, Commissioner of Public Lands, right here. Now this is made, dated uh, May 25th, 1922. I beg to acknowledge receipt of resolution passed by your society in regard to the addition of Poliahu Park. The, um, please be informed I recommended to Governor Farrington that if desired to be said made into a park, request the Terrorist Store Survey Office. Next letter. The, here is Commissioner of Public Lands. At a meeting of the Historical Society held, okay, resolved that the Kauai Historical Society, another letter, they're petitioning the governor until finally they get a letter from the governor approving Poliahu Park. And they create the, the Poliahu. Later on, they add the Pu'u Key Ridge and the birthstones to it. Then they go on to Haola. Next one. 
They're trying to put up the, the markers in order to identify it and to let people know, hey, you have a, a historic area. Prior, no one really knew what was going on. Even back then, the, the, the territory were they're taking stones. And you see the society stepping up every time and making people put the stones back. And uh, so they were strong advocates for Wailoa from the very beginning. Now, the early scientific work on Kauai, we have quite a bit in our, in our society. And uh, so you have eminent scientists from all over the world who are studying things. Another one, too, as you get a little bit further on, is Smithsonian was here early on at the turn of the century. I'm not aware of that material. Uh, I would sure like to go into the Smithsonian and, and find those studies. We don't have copies of them in the society that I'm aware of. Next one. Now here it is, Haola, stones removed. Now sets the, the society off. And um, in this particular case, I think they were successful in getting the stones put back. Others, they weren't. But they were building the berm right in front of Cocoa Palms along that beach right there and filling it in. The stones from Haola were used to that. Also, there was a train track coming right through the Hikinakala. Um, and when many of the, uh, the stones were moved uh, around, but they were chasing all of these stones all over the place. And so, thank God for, their, uh, for those efforts. Many discussions about the city of refuge. Hikinakala in Wailua has a mirror by the, exactly the same name, Hikinakala and Waimeao. And back then, the society was, was interested in these two city of refuge, or the Pu'uhonua. Right now, the, in this last couple of months, been looking into it because they're trying to, trying to define the history of Waimeao. And uh, in the center of town, right there by the post office, uh, right along that edge, is a Heiau 273 feet by 90. And that's, that was the city of refuge. It was a Heiau called Hikinakala. Waimea, in the early days, was the capital of uh, Kona, as, as Wailu was the capital of Puna. There's two capitals on this island, two royal centers. We always say that Wailu is the political and religious center, but I think we can argue that they both were super centers. And when you do the mirror, and when you take a really good look at what's going on in Waimea, it's the exact mirror of what's happening in Wailua also. And so that duality. The other part is there was only two city of refuges on this island. That's where it kind of seems to, to, to be right now. Only two. And I also do know that if you broke the kapu, you had a chance to run for it. But 99.99% of them never made it. Uh, because you're in the heart of the royal center, you're going to go through an army of guards? No way. You truly had to be touched by the gods to make it. So just because you made a run for it, again, you truly had to be blessed by something extraordinary for you to even make it into the confines. And then, you know, some stories say they, they, after a while, a little stint, you were allowed to let go. No, not, I haven't seen that. Your life was dedicated to that place. The um, next one. The birthstones, again, they're trying to include the birthstones into the Poliahu Park. So they created that whole area uh, in there. Here's a little funny little vignette right here, the, the, which I hotel at Wailua Estates, right? And this is Duncan McGride right here, uh, essentially saying, you know, every summer I have all these people staying with me, you know, and I'm so sick and tired of it. So he puts this <laughs> ad in the paper saying the hotels and the Duncan uh, McBride Hotel is in Wailua with the express purpose of, because uh, he lives in Waiawa, you know. And uh, so he's, he's telling everybody, you know, you know, go to Wailua, but leave me alone, you know. And uh, uh, it took a little while to kind of get down to the bottom of that. You know, any hotel in Wailua in the 1850s, yeah, you, something curious is up. Next one. Again, you know, the society is stepping up in uh, holding people to task by obliterating history. Here, an old cedar stands. The, um, at the Brown Estate in Wailua, it was a cedar tree. The society went there and, and uh, had it all chopped up and made their boardroom tables and chairs and desks out of this particular cedar tree. And uh, does anybody remember? Do we have any cedar in the, uh, in the society? I'm going to be looking. Um, <laughs> I do remember the, that some things out of that, but now I have to look at it now that I've seen this. 
Nomilo is the crater out there on the, in, at the, on the seashore at Kala Hill. In those days, the society took a good look at it. They were identified two, so, two stones, which are the protectors of the pond itself. Their studies of Nomilu at this particular time are really important in the history of Nomilu. And because it, it identifies all of the, the cultural aspects of these ponds. Next one. We're almost through. The, um, again, you know, here's the last, I think this one. Uh, yeah, we already seen this one right here. Yeah, never mind, keep going. The uh, Hyena Caves, the, the park at the end of the road. It was the Kauai Historical Society who moved to create the, and preserve the end of the road. And uh, then uh, Reverend Lydgate's passing away. So here's a resolution right here. It's a beautiful vignette of Reverend Lydgate uh, right here. Next one. And then this is where they're, they're adding. They're starting to, to actually, the sites are getting marked. Next one. There's a little story here about the, the battle between um, the forces of command. This is the War of 1825 here on Kauai. It's the darkest, deepest, ugliest, nastiest part of our island's history. It was a massacre that lasted a year and a half. And uh, this was the first battles that set this off right here. You have Hofgard saying, no, that battleground is under the grounds of the Kalaheo uh, High School. Um, and so right away, it was like, what? And then you have William Hyde Rice. Oh, I, was, I thought it was a little bit further in the Wahiawa. And he begins to explain. So the society is starting to look for these battlegrounds and their stories. But we always heard that they was in the Wahiawa Valley, in the gulch itself, that the hardest part of the battles took place. And, uh, but a lot of people died in that year and a half. And also in this one, well, we're talking about Maulili, it's the main war temple for Koloa. Uh, it's right there in the middle of town, very few people know what about it, but it's, it's, uh, it's an insane war temple. And it's in the, um, the Cavello, the story of Cavello, which takes place in the late 1500s, early 1600s or so. I just thought right over here that uh, there was a reference to going up um, in a particular area, uh, Kahili Kolo, above Kilauea, uh, a grove of running koa trees. What do they mean by a running koa tree? The, I thought I'd ask anyone here if they knew uh, what reference are they making to the running koa tree. And, um, it's curious. Next one. First time, the election of uh, the first librarian that moves in. They moved into the, where the, Ka the Kauai Museum is. It was a library. They moved upstairs. So the first home of the society was in that building right there. The society has many homes. The, a paper right here, Relation Kamehameha and Komuli, is really interesting. Next one. They also preserve the Menihune or the Awai Nui O Kikiola, but they call it the Menihune Ditch. And again, they saw that they were building the road construction. Many stones came to light. People were taking them for construction projects. Society steps in and says, no more. And we are lucky because that's one of the greatest engineers we have to our name as the people of Kauai. And, uh, and although, you know, that wall used to be 20 feet tall and we're only looking at it this high now. But uh, at least we have the fragments of it left still there. And then um, now here comes this long discussion about the cannons and many different kinds of cannons from all over the places. One in Moloa, there's one in Kilauea, another one that the Japanese use to celebrate. They fire off every year at an anniversary to celebrate. So there's all these little funny vignettes about these cannons. Next one. Why Ali Ali? Lots of things in the ascent of Wai Ali Ali, in the exploration and the people that are going up there. So in the society, we have many, many accounts of trips up there. It's always difficult. And uh, I thought one day it would make a really good paper because uh, I have some friends who go there who know it. And it would be kind of cool to bring it up to date, you know, and essentially what it's, li what it's like up there. Next one. The death of William Hyde Rice right here and um, that resolution right there. Now, the next president. So you have this John Lydgate and William Hyde Rice and Elsie already all the way through for the first 10 years. The, and in this state right here, the, we're, we're looking at 1925. The, the new president, Eric Augustus Knudsen. Now, 
the society right here is uh, moving to preserve Ka'uluapa'oa, which is the heiau at the end of the road in Ha'ena. And again, you know, the fact that we still have that has everything to do with the society. Next one. The, um, these are really good letters right here. Let's go into the last page. And let's finish it up. We can't really see it, but let me just go through. I've already mentioned certain of things right here. The advocacy for Nomilu, advocacy for the Menuhuni Ditch. The, they raised a lot of money for the Ha'ena uh, Heiau. The advocacy for the preservation of the Russian Fort Elizabeth. And um, I meant to have the letter from Aubrey Robinson. We have quite a bit of, of correspondence with the Robinson family in, the, in that day from Aubrey. Uh, um, and uh, those letters are really cool. Uh, here we say, you know, the marking of the Wailua sites from with Kenneth, Kenneth Emery. He was, he's a very interesting, he also worked for the Bishop Museum. The, they advocated against creating the national parks. Yes, I think people who, who, who are aware in the 60s, the, um, even earlier, yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah, already right there in the 40s they're doing, but it comes up again in the 60s, yeah? The, yeah, but the whole island voters said, no way do we want the federal park. So there's this whole thing in terms of, uh, of that aspects of it. The, they are instrumental. We're the ones who established Koke'e Museum. From that board, essentially went up onto the mountain. And uh, it goes on and on and on and on and on. The point is, is that uh, The work that, this, that the society has done in the last 104 years is really cool. The continuity over the, the, the decades is there. The society is still keeping immaculate records. And uh, this is just a fragment of some of the things that are going on. I just covered the first 20 years of it. But by 1928, you have the 90 years ago, you have the Captain Cook celebration. The society ramps up to the max, and it takes front row center uh, in the Captain Cook celebration in those days. The amount of material produced out of that is phenomenal. And it continues on and on and on. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Ma'ki ha'ilana ke'aloha 